Hi everyone, welcome to the panel. I'm hoping you can hear me. If somebody cannot, please let me know in the chat. Um, so welcome to the panel on Accelerationism and the Manosphere. Lovely to see you all virtually this evening. I'm Ashton Kingdon. I'm a member of the advisory board of the Accelerationism Research Consortium, and it is such a joy to host this event tonight. So we've got three amazing speakers this evening, which I'm going to introduce in turn, and they are going to present to you. If you have any questions at all during their presentations, please type them in the chat, and then I will also um, be asking questions at the end anyone wants to put their mic and camera on to ask them. So before we kick off with our first speaker, we actually have some welcoming words from Nicholas Rasmussen. Uh, he is the Executive Director of the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism, so GIFCT. So we have a short video to watch before we start with our panel tonight. So I will hand over to the wonderful GNET team who will present the video for you. Hello, my name is Nick Rasmussen and I serve as the Executive Director of GIFCT, the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism. It's my great privilege and pleasure to welcome each of you to this year's conference organized and hosted by the Global Network on Extremism and Technology. And while I wish I could join you in person, we are very pleased that the conference itself this year has a hybrid format, with sessions this week taking place both virtually and in person, and that you're joined in London by our Director of Programming, Dr. Aaron Saltman. And that's an important step forward for all of us as in-person contact, in-person conversation and dialogue is a critical part of all of our work. And we are all way better off when we have the opportunity to meet not only in formal sessions, but also informally over coffee or a meal or a drink at the end of the day's events. So my congrats to Shiraz and his team for organizing this week's event. And as most of you know, GNET is GIFCT's academic partner. Whenever I say that though, I feel like I need to insert the word indispensable in there so that everybody knows just how critical GNET work is to our mission at GIFCT. And that mission is to prevent terrorists and violent extremists from exploiting digital platforms and the online environment. That mission requires us to continue advancing the state of knowledge that we all have of this complex space between technology, technology and terrorism and to better understand the latest trends in the terrorist threat landscape. And those of you who've heard me speak before about GIFCT know that our work is organized into three distinct pillars with LEARN being one of those important pillars. And that's where GNET comes into play. Helping us make sense of this complicated, challenging environment is what your GNET scholar network, expert network and practitioner network does so well. In 2021, GNET published 145 separate insight papers, short, concise, topical, and highly relevant to our GIFCT membership and to our broader global stakeholder community. Those in insight authors came from 22 different countries around the world, which ensured that a diverse and regionally expert set of voices were speaking to these critical topics. And this year alone in 2022, G Network has already included timely analysis of the ways in which violent extremists tied to far right and Islamist extremist ideologies are seeking to take advantage of the Russian aggression against Ukraine. GNET work in 2022 has also involved analysis of, of the Taliban's more sophisticated use of Telegram and other platforms to bolster their standing, both globally and in Afghanistan locally. And GNET's work this year has contributed significantly to our, our understanding of the linkage between online activity and offline real world harm. That last topic is one of particular importance to us at GIFCT as we work with companies every day to try to address the content most likely to result in real world harm. And beyond the prodigious output of, of papers and analytical pieces, GNET affiliated scholars are making incredibly valuable contributions to GIFCT's work by their participation in our various working group activities. GNET participation in that work helps ensure that the policy focused discussions in our working groups are grounded in evidence based research, which is a vital piece that you bring to the table. In short, the work of GIFCT and the value that we bring to, to our member companies is tied directly to the work that ICSR and the GNET network is guiding uh, and participating in producing every day. And all of that work is animated by a single idea, that we all need to do more to contribute to a safer and healthier online ecosystem. Now, as you'd expect, the program this week is populated by a diverse and challenging set of topics with an equally diverse and impressive set of voices 
set to participate and share expertise. GIFCT, for its part, is happy to be hosting the dinner and drinks event to close the conference later in the week. So please do make the most of this week, and I really do look forward to consuming as much of the available content as I am able to this week. So thank you, Shiraz and the GNET team, for the opportunity to welcome the community to London, and good luck with the rest of the week. Thank you. So up first then, very excited to welcome Alexandria Anoha, who is an Applied Developmental Psychology PhD student at Suffolk University. Her primary line of research examines the impact of far-right ideologies on Black adolescents. I was just checking that I didn't make that noise, apologies. <laughs> um, and it's, yeah, sorry, and explores the intersection of misogynoir and far-right ideologies. In particular, Alexandria centers her work on promoting black child development and ways educators, youth practitioners and communities can help support and enhance the brilliance of black children. She is committed to using her research to cultivate evidence-based practices for higher education, black families, technology and other areas relevant to her research. Lastly, she is a mentee and board member of the Institute for Research on Male Supremacism, working with experts in far-right studies to provide new theoretical understandings of threats posed by right-wing misogynist groups and individuals. Her work has been featured in The Mail magazine, Boston Globe, The Progressive and more. So very excited to welcome you, Alexandria, and I will hand the floor over to you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I'm going to sign off. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Alexandria Anoa, and I'm a second year PhD student in applied developmental psychology at Suffolk University in the Youth Equity Sexuality Lab. And today I'm going to talk to you about how Black feminist thought is an epistemological orientation in exploring the manosphere. Um, I want to highlight the recent white supremacist violence that has caused Black communities to suffer. Um, I believe that it is my mission to honor them. Um, and Black women activists, theorists, and creatives have been dreaming about freedom since our inception. We have been naming the far right as a serious threat to our lives because it has infiltrated our communities in ways such as the Black manosphere. So today I'll be briefly touching on two GNET pieces I wrote in a paper in preparation that discusses the psychological experiences of Black women when confronting far right threats in online spaces. So to ground my research methods and my own theorizing of the Black manosphere and how it impacts Black women and girls, I engage in literature from Black feminist thought and positive youth development. So Black feminist thought allows us to understand intersectionality and misogynoir towards Black women and girls. And specifically, misogynoir is a specific hate and prejudice um, towards Black women as described by Dr. Moya Bailey. And developmental psychology um, allows us to understand the context of a young person that either promotes or hinders their thriving. And Black girlhood and Black boyhood represents fields of knowledge in child and family studies. This is not representing a binary. So to get into Black feminist thought, Black feminist thought brought to us by Patricia Hill Collins within research methods means that we must have a deeper power analysis of our work. So Black feminist thought is integral in our understanding of the Black manosphere and the far right. Black feminist thought has tenets um, that were both used in the writing of the articles and conducting a qualitative case study. So the tenets were used as methodology. So we reflected on interlocking systems of oppression, the various experiences of Black women, Black women meaning that Black women have multiple experiences and that we're not monolithic and also self-definition and also positioning Black women as producers of knowledge. When we think about um, conceptions or ideas about the far right, these are overrepresented by white scholars and we are not able to understand how Black women are making meaning of the far right and the Black manosphere. And another tenant is having a social justice practice. So this brings forth the question of how do we go from theory knowledge to practice to shift the social conditions? So for the first GNET piece, I use black feminist thought to frame my exploration of how anti-blackness is relevant to technology and terrorism. I do so by depicting the ways misogynoir shows up in digital media. There are so many examples of anti-black misogyny or in other words, misogynoir represented in digital media. 
For instance, when we see Black women harmed publicly, many will turn to social media and other online spaces to justify violence towards Black women and organize against Black women online. Within online spaces, there has been an increase of Black male content that seeks to affirm Black men while devaluing Black women. So anti-Blackness and male supremacy are descended from larger systems of oppression, white supremacy and misogyny respectively, and Black feminist intellectuals such as Bell Hooks have named these systems explicitly. These systems are perpetuated through male-dominated spaces online. The second GNET piece, I researched statistics on Black femicide. The statistics were alarming, especially the first one here, um, where the FBI reported that in 2020, at least four Black women were killed per day. I also looked into other areas and found that podcasts were a focal point when misogyn where misogynoir is normalized. Many people may think it's a reach or a jump to connect the death of Black women and girls with the Black manosphere. However, as researchers, we know that the manosphere can result in physical violence, which is why as a Black woman, I want to hold the Black manosphere accountable for upholding white and male supremacist ideologies that can result in violence. And lastly, we conducted a qualitative case study um, with Black women college students to explore their psychological experiences of far-right activity, including the Black manosphere. So one of our research questions was, where and how are Black women college students encountering far-right misogynoir in college contexts? We drew from Black feminist thought, qualitative methods laid out by Evans Winters and critical thematic analysis from Lawless and Chen to identify various manifestations. So we use far-right misogynoir as to introduce a new concept and to use it as our analytical framework of understanding the psychological experiences of Black women and really to bridge Black feminist thought, critical far-right studies and psychology. So Jean, one, one of the participants, Jean, detailed a common experience consistent with other psychological literature, which says Black women face oppression from multiple groups because of their social position within society. So she identifies Black men on her campus specifically as one of the groups that do not value Black women. She mentions online spaces where both white and Black men engage in harmful ideas. The Black manosphere is an area that impedes the structural well-being of Black women. And lastly, this study is, in, is currently in preparation to be submitted, um, and I will share more findings. And lastly, centering those at the margins is really crucial to my research agenda and the, the, two, the two GNET pieces and the qualitative study. Um, this research and writing, the, this research project and the writing projects contribute to the field of psychology, critical far-right studies, and Black girlhood studies. The goal of my research is to honor the knowledge from women of color, name systems explicitly, and use research findings for practice and policy suggestions. My work is both research and practice. For me, this is beyond research. It's truly about taking what we know about the manosphere and shifting the social conditions of women at the margins. Thank you so much for listening to my panel, and I'm open to further conversations about this research. Here's my information where you can follow me on Twitter and my email. And lastly, I want to say special thanks to my collaborators and the Institute of Male Supremacism. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alexandria. That was really, really interesting. I actually remember reading your insight when it came out and loving okay. it. Um, we have some questions in the chat, which I've stored in a, in a document so we can ask you at the end. Um, okay, great. Yeah, so I'm going to now hand over to Erica. Um, so Erica Barbarossa, again, I hope I didn't butcher the pronunciation of that, is the research lead for the Center on Terrorism, Extremism and Counterterrorism. Prior to this position, Erica worked as a graduate research assistant for CTEC's online extremism project, which led to her interest in online extremism and radicalization. Other interests include right-wing terrorism, women and children's involvement in terrorist groups, and Russian area studies. Before her involvement with the Middlebury Institute, Erica served as a William J. Fulbright English teaching assistant finalist in the Russian Federation. 
Erica has a master's degree in non-proliferation <laughs> sorry, and terrorism studies from the Middlebury Institute and in international relations, global security, nuclear politics and weapons of mass destruction. Proliferation from Moscow State Institute of International Studies. She received her bachelor's in Russian from Slavic Studies from New York University. That's a lot of accomplishments. Very That's a lot of Russian. <laughs> Pleased to have you here, Erica. I will hand the floor over to you. Really excited for your presentation. Okay. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, and despite my very lengthy um, history with Russian studies and such, that is not what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so for today, I'm going to be presenting and kind of um, talking about my findings for one of the insights I wrote for GNET on the involuntary celibacy movement and the narrative and how it plays into greater accelerationist narratives. Um, primarily how this incel narrative leads its followers to support and engage in accelerationist violence. So first, what are incels? Um, we can't really talk about accelerationist movements within the manosphere without talking about incels, um, considering they are a main character within this space. As you would expect, incels are men who define themselves as involuntarily celibate, meaning they are repeatedly rejected by women and therefore fail to find sexual and romantic success with them. Although this community began in the 1990s as a support group for people who are struggling romantically and sexually, um, this community grew toxic rather quickly once it migrated into the online space. Today, among incel forums online, you'll find postings containing virulent misogyny and propagating male supremacy. Alongside this are statements that promote hatred and violence, which serve as a mobilizing factor for those incels who have escalated to violence in the past. Uh, these incel-led attacks spanning across mainly North America and Europe were not only cast in retribution for their perceived rejections, but also due to the threat of an imminent male demise that is ingrained within the incel narrative. So for my, the purpose of my research, it was important for me to differentiate between the incel identity and the incel narrative. How I define the incel identity is um, an identity that is determined by the involuntary celibacy that they feel has been imposed upon them. This means that incels are ruled by a sense of failure, specifically their failure to receive what they feel they are owed and what they are entitled to. Um, without sex and love, something they feel every human should have, the prospect of marriage, children, and the big old happily ever after are denied for them as well. Um, this failure and the idea that they are denied what they are owed then leads incels towards feeling of resentment and hostility towards women, which forms the foundation of misogyny that really rules this strange culture. Um, in this culture, we have seen um, typically like the rise of incel slang, such as references to Chad and Stacey's and larger ideas to promote ideas uh, or promote answers, provide answers for why incels um, are involuntarily celibate. One such answer is this idea of hypergamy, female hypergamy, which states that women are genetically predetermined to seek the most attractive mate. Um, in a patriarchal society, incels believed that women, since they had no opportunity outside of motherhood and as a wife, um, were forced into marriages to incels. But with the rise of progressivism, feminism, women gaining more rights, now incels are kind of led in the dust because women will choose rather to be alone rather than to be with an incel. So within all this, there is a digression of traditional gender roles um, and the family unit. Um, along with these ideas, they believe masculinity and biological male supremacy are some of the essential pieces of society that liberals and feminism are is attacking. Um, and this feeds into the incel narrative, which is broadly determined by the belief that women and liberals are launching a war against men. Many incels have found um, been found claiming that women are either instinctively motivated to take out men, kind of pointing to the predetermined genetic um, drivers that they believe women have, um, or they are consciously and collectively as a group organizing to abuse them. These examples you can find online within discourse talking about ideas such as like familial court, where usually mothers get full custody, um, or the Me Too movement claiming that these sexual assault and harassment allegations are false and being used by women to um, use men as a scapegoat and imprison them. So that's where you can really find it. But this idea manifested into the existential crisis um, against men, specifically in cells in particular. Um, but despite their claims of being in this war involuntarily, a concerning amount of incels agreed that the only solution is violence. So how does accelerationism fit in? I'll go a bit deeper into the existential crisis element in just a minute, but first let's point to how accelerationists influence 
fits in, um, specifically in this case, militant accelerationism, um, which ARC has defined as a set of tactics and strategies designed to put pressure on latent social divisions, exacerbate them, and hasten societal collapse. So what do accelerationists want? Societal collapse, the next question we can ask is, how do they cause this? Um, one such tactic they employ is infiltrating and inspiring pre-existing radicalized spaces that are vulnerable to this and working as force amplifiers uh, within this space to inspire those to commit violence that feed into the greater accelerationist goal. Um, so with the narrative I just covered, we can easily see that the incel community represents one of those very vulnerable spaces. So how can accelerationists use the incel, and probably do, use the incel narrative to motivate them towards violence? Um, they need to establish some key things. One being the idea that society is irreparably corrupt. Um, there's no fixing it. Um, two, they need to have their in-group identity believed to be under serious threat, um, the existential threat. And three, they need to believe that there is no political solution to mitigate this threat. There is only violence or dealing with the idea at hand. Um, so all of these ideas already exist in the incel space. In regards to how society is corrupt, an essential element um, in the incel rhetoric is that society is now gynocentric, meaning that it exclusively concentrates on women, their point of view, their needs, their wants. Um, they say that this shift happened because weak beta men um, were allow allowed women more rights um, as a way of wooing them, but this has irrevocably shifted the gender balance dynamics against men, much to their own detriment. This genocentric society is said to love to frame men as society's perpetual scapegoat. And incels often claim that media and education and other societal institutions are complicit in these endeavors, which is why we don't see incel representation within government and media. Um, this idea that we live in this corrupt society is fundamental in framing that there is an existential threat against men. Um, this existential threat idea against a defined in-group has led to violence countless times in the past. Um, just last weekend, we were able to see how the great replacement theory played a vital role in mobilizing 18-year-old Peter Gendron to commit mass violence in Buffalo, New York. Um, so the promotion of the great replacement theory or white genocide we saw provides a justification within these communities for vi violence in the name of self-defense. And we can see this rationalization applicable in the incel perception of women and progressives um, involving in like their decimation of masculinity and trying to abuse men. So as for the threat, um, we see a lot of dystopian narratives float around on the web and incel forums. Um, some claim that the ultimate goal of women and liberals is to enslave men, take away their rights um, so that they'll be forced um, into reproduction and raped, um, also forced into unwanted marriages. Um, and those that are unable or unwilling to go into these marriages will have a quote unquote bachelor tax that they'll have to pay, which um, specifically targets incels who cannot attain marriage. Um, this rhetoric we've seen has led to some incels becoming preppers. There are some very popular incel influencers, if you will, that try to prepare um, incels into what, where to go and how to do it and like live off the grid. Uh, but we also see in the more violent spaces, uh, men saying that they should blow, fight back by blowing up sperm banks, self-castrating, committing suicide, or in the, many cases, accelerating the destruction of society. The combination of believing in a corrupt society and dystopian feministic future, we can see leads incels to believe that there is no political solution, that essential idea to accelerationism. Um, ultimately, these narratives are crafted to motivate incels towards violence. Um, it's important to note, Coper wrote, um, prior to the popularization of accelerationism, at least to the level that we see today, incels often peddled the phrase and still do Coper rope, meaning you cope with society and like your hellish existence as an incel or you rope. Um, we see a lot of suicide ideation within the community, um, but now with accelerationism on the table, there, we can see a subset of incels wanting to accelerate the collapse of society to restore the gender balance um, and get back what they feel they're owed. Uh, so beyond the framings I discussed in the last slide, there are some overlaps that prove that the two communities are very compatible. Uh, one very briefly is this idea of sainthood. Um, we've seen countless times that within accelerationist communities, there's the glorification of saints like Tarrant, Bowers, Versailles. Um, incels also engage in the canonization of incel attackers, most notably being Elliot Roger, who is on your screen. Um, he's one of the main saints and users were all 
often promote violence by telling each other to quote unquote go ER, meaning conduct a similar murder spree that he did in 2014. Um, in addition to incel attackers, incels have also been seen glorifying mass killers that don't identify as incel or with the ideology, um, such as Stephen Paddock, the Vegas mass killer. Um, they applaud him for taking out quote unquote normies. Um, the communities are further compatible because of their common enemies. Um, the villainization of feminism and modernity in general are staples in far-right accelerationist communities. Um, and the messaging to motivate insults towards violence is very similar to what is preached in far-right extremism. Um, one example of this is the, this idea of returning to masculinity and restoring masculinity through violence. Um, the rise of feminism and progressivism is seen as synonymous with the destruction of masculinity and male supremacy. So they kind of paint this idea of through violent actions, both milieus can restore their masculinity, what they were lost, reconnect with who they're supposed to be, which are these warrior gladiator heroes. Um, so any call that we see um, say, saying to restore your masculinity and be a man again um, is an implicit call to action, in my opinion. Uh, we can kind of also see this in the Buffalo Shooters Manifesto. If you have read it, there is a section that says, you um, know, the time for meekness has long since passed. The time for democratic solution has long since passed. And then he says the men of the West must be men once more. So it's obviously a centralizing theme within incel communities and all right, <coughs> sorry, communities. Uh, <coughs> so overall, the intel narrative of there being a war on men. So sorry. Um, and this existential crisis against men is similar with the accelerationist community, meaning that the incel community re represents a clear and present danger threat to of accelerationist violence in the future. <coughs> and that is my end, um, slowly choking to death. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was excellent. If anyone has any questions for Erica, we will be doing questions at the end as well, but please do pop them in the chat. And now last but not least, we have John Lewis from the Programme on Extremism. He is a research fellow there where he studies domestic violent extremism with a specialization in the evolution of accelerationist white supremacists and anti-government movements in the United States and federal responses to the threat. He is also an investigator with the National Counterterrorism Innovation Technology and Education Center and leads policy research for the Accelerationist Research Consortium. Another happy clappy topic. I will hand the floor over to you from your hotel room in lovely London. Yeah, uh, thank you. Ashton, obviously very happy to be here uh, in, in London in this hotel room uh, at this at this conference. Obviously, first and foremost, thank you to GIVCT, GNET, ICSR for the invitation to speak uh, at this event, at this very important conference on this very important set of, of obviously very, very timely topics. Um, initially, I was I was going to prepare uh, a handful of slides uh, relating to Boogaloo movement in the U.S., post-organizational extremism, and, and I'm, I'm glad I didn't because I think um, here, I think, especially given the, the really important topics that we've covered so far already in the first two presentations, it's important to kind of take a step back and really look at some of the building blocks, um, some of the challenges that we face ahead and, and talk about, you know, some of the some of the potential solutions here and, and responses. Um, so last year, I, I spoke at the inaugural GNET conference on the future forecasting panel, and we discussed how the violent extremism landscape would evolve, how it would shift in the near future, how it would metastasize, how it would change, and, and, and how we would respond to that threat in, in, in the years to come. Um, and I think, unfortunately, sitting here today, a lot of, a lot of what we discussed you know, nearly a year ago um, in the aftermath of January 6th is, is very similar today, right? A fractured threat landscape, the increasingly disparate online nature of domestic violent extremist movements in the US, and the continued threat posed by lone actor violent extremists. Um, and I think, unfortunately, you know, a really pressing topic to cover here today is that the U.S. government response, which is one of the um, areas that I focus in on for the program on extremism, as well as um, for my work through, through Insight, through uh, GNET, through the Acceleration Research Consortium, is, is the U.S. government response to the threat and how that has evolved in, in recent years or in some cases hasn't evolved. Um, 
I think especially given the events of Buffalo this last weekend and given the, the continued discussions around things like mental health, mental illness, um, great replacement theory, mainstreaming of white supremacy, um, the role of, of social media platforms and tech companies. And I think these are all very important topics to kind of bring together here and, and discuss. And I think as we look at it within the, within the lens of accelerationism, as Alexandria and Erica covered off on so eloquently in their presentations, it's, it's incredibly important to understand this, this kind of post-organizational space that we sit in, whether it's the manosphere, whether it's incels, whether it's neo-fascist networks that are largely online, whether it's lone actors like the alleged perpetrator of the Buffalo attack this past weekend, the, these, many of these individuals exist in, or are at least inspired by much of the same right-wing ecosystem. Um, especially when you look at this, this specific brand of what Erica discussed of this, this militant accelerationism, this is, this is really a concept and a trend that has directly or indirectly served to motivate many of the, the kind of most infamous acts of violence, of hate, in, in the U.S. and abroad that we've seen in, 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 in the recent years, whether it's Oslo, Charleston, El Paso, Pittsburgh, Christchurch, and, and now, sadly, Buffalo. Um, and so I think when you, when you look at the, the various elements of the alleged perpetrator's ideology, his worldview, his manifesto, the, the Discord transcripts, as, as well as small tactical things, right? Like the gun he used, the images and iconography he chose to put on his gun, his homages to the Christchurch shooter, Brenton Tarrant, all of these things taken together do, do serve to suggest that militant accelerationism and, and specifically here, this, this kind of white supremacist, neo-fascist embracing of the great replacement theory of this, you know, this idea that, 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 that minorities, that Jews will not replace us, this idea that there is no political solution, you know, all of these concepts taken together serve, serve to really indicate where this individual's worldview was when he committed this this alleged act, um, and I, you know, I think the the one thing that that we've we've talked about a lot in the past year that that really can't be overlooked is how mainstream so many of these once kind of niche fringe concepts have become in the United States, um, especially something like the Great Replacement Theory, right? A once kind of fringe um, kind of conspiracy that white European populations were being replaced by, in, in, this, in, in, in that instance, largely Muslim immigrants, um, really took hold in the U.S. in the last six, seven years, and really was, was latched onto by, by significant portions of the, the mainstream right who were, were, were looking for that, that kind of um, easy villain in, in a lot of the immigration discussions that have taken place in, in this country. And when you look at the, the rhetoric that, that has been used, um, whether it's in neo-fascist telegram channels, whether it's on 4chan, whether it's on Gab, um, or whether it's on Fox News, or whether it's in, in the halls of Congress, um, you're, you're hearing the same things. You're seeing the same topics being brought up. You're seeing the same kind of war rhetoric, the war language, the, this idea that for, for significant portions of the right today in the U.S., it is extended far beyond the, this kind of narrow idea of terrorism, right? It's, it's, it's extended far beyond that into elements of not just terrorism, but political violence and th this acceptance that every single piece of narrative, every single piece of rhetoric, every single hot flashpoint issue is, is part of this broader culture war, is part of this broader us versus them. And, you know, the, the, the fate of the U.S., of, of your American traditions, of, of your way of life, of your family um, are all are all at stake, and when you when you look back, um, not just in the last year, but but in, in in the past several years, you can really trace back this this through line and, and see how this this same right wing ecosystem, again largely online, continue to promote, continue to propagate so many of these very dangerous white supremacist, anti Semitic, anti immigrant, anti LGBTQ narratives, which we can really take and make a direct through line to acts of violence that, that take place, which, which, which we've discussed here at length. And I think it's, it's really important to consider the, the fact that 
as we continue down this path, as we continue to see the erosion of, of democracy in, in the U.S., as we continue to see this, this increase in anti-democratic activity, anti-democratic norms becoming kind of part and parcel of the mainstream, um, it stands to reason that, that you will see more individuals, especially in this accelerationist strand of neo-fascism, of anti-government extremism, take action in, in furtherance of some of these ideas. And, and it, it goes back to, to the work um, that Erica has done at CTEC, the work of um, my colleagues at ARC, like Matt Kreiner and Megan Conroy, who have really laid out in, in very clear detail that, you know, the idea that there is no political solution is not going away. This idea that you have to take action because there is no set of conditions that can be done in normal circumstances that can change the course of where this country is headed. And as you see more and more individuals in the mainstream continue to promote that, it, it, it has to raise red flags for us as, as extremism researchers. Um, and I think just kind of um, briefly here, because I'm conscious of time and, and keen to get into the Q&A here, um, I think the, the, the real challenge here when you talk about the government response is that largely on, on the U.S. government side, they're, they're still fighting the war on terror. Um, Many, many of the kind of traditional counterterrorism apparatus tools that, that were used with, with great effect um, in the early 2000s against Al Qaeda, in the 2010s against the Islamic State, um, really aren't fit for purpose or, or, or in many cases as, as relevant or applicable as they should be to deal with this really emergent, burgeoning threat of not just accelerationism, but, but the kind of continued right-wing extremism, mainstreaming of white supremacy, and, and the, the, the rhetoric and narratives that, that lead individuals, including accelerationists, down that pathway to an act of mass violence like we saw in Buffalo. And the, the, the real challenge here is that this, this kind of, you know, 2000s group-centric thinking, this idea that terrorism in the U.S. is, is, is not done by your white neighbor, but it's, it's done by the, the individual down the street um, who, who is a migrant, who has, you know, communications with someone who, you know, is, is sitting in Iraq, sitting in Syria and has a connection to a designated foreign terrorist organization. And really, you know, today, you know, especially when you, when you look at, you know, recent, recent attacks, recent plots, recent arrests and disruptions by the FBI, most of the potential violence that we've seen, most of the violent plots that we've seen emerge from individuals who really have not only no connection to a designated group, but no real connection to any of these traditional, traditional terrorist ideologies, right? And so it really raises this question of, you know, how can the U.S. government, you know, turn that apparatus, develop new strategies, new policies, new, new trends to better understand that, you know, the, the call is coming from inside the House, right? And you, you have to look no further than January 6th. You have to look no further than, you know, the fact that you know, in, in dozens of states, there are individuals running for local, state, federal office who were either at January 6th or promoted the, the Stop the Steal conspiracy, this kind of, you know, continued right-wing media ecosystem that pushes everything from COVID-19 pandemic conspiracies to Stop the Steal conspiracy to anti-critical race theory to anti-trans grooming conspiracies to the Great Replacement Theory. And these these things can't be separated out and delineated as merely, you know, rhetoric or speech that is entirely separate, distinct, and unrelated from, from the acts of violence that then call out that exact rhetoric by name, right? And I think stuff like what we saw in Buffalo is a great example of that. Um, and so just, again, very, very quickly here to close, um, I think as, as you know, the, the goal of conferences like these really should be for, for us to come together. Obviously, we're all largely in agreement on many of these issues, I, I think, but I think it, it really is important, especially in the aftermath of, of incidents like Buffalo to think about how, how we as researchers can better inform policy, better inform policymakers, you know, provide actionable um, directions, provide actionable ideas to tech companies, to social media platforms, both big and small. You know, the work of GIFCT and, and Tech Against Terrorism in these spaces is, is tremendously important. And, and that collaboration has to extend to us as, as researchers as well. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave it at that and, and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, John. That was fantastic. So if all the speakers could put their cameras back on, I have some excellent questions for you in the chat. So thank you so much for those of you that have already put them in. Any questions that pop
pop into your mind, please do feel free to ask them. Welcome back, everyone. Wait for Alexandria. Hey. Hey. So the first question is actually for you, Alexandria, from Peter. So how do you think radicalism differs from black youth to white youth? Very interesting. Question. I think that's a really interesting question. I have my little notes here. <laughs> you had some prep time. <laughs> yes, I did have some time. Um, I think what I'll say is like, first in my work, I don't necessarily pay attention to differences. But what I will say that the reasons for black males and joining the manosphere has to do a lot with, in my opinion, internalized racism. And misogyny and racism will be at play for both white and black boys. I think for black boys, there may be an element of, again, internalized or self-directed racism. You could also say that for black boys, they also may have you know, more contact with black girls. And so violence from black boys may have a different impact on black girls around them than the violence from white boys. But I think within my approach is very much an anti-oppression lens. And not necessarily, I'm not saying that differences don't matter, but what I will say is that the result is violence. So either way, my work is centering black communities and specifically black women and girls. So I think that, I mean, essentially, I think that there may be a slight difference because ex because experience, um, black males tend to have their own experiences apart from white males. Um, but again, for white incels, there are barriers to healthy relationships with women, in my opinion, is because of their own an internalized misogyny and their belief that women owe them something. And for black for black incels, it's it's truly about internalized racism. And I think that's an excellent question that I, I want to explore more. So thank you, Peter. Thanks for your answer there. Um, so next we'll go to Erica. I've got a few questions for you. So I'm interested in your thoughts on how much does the general discourse coming from right-wing America on mainstream news media amplify incel narratives and enable violence? Do you see a correlation of any sort? That's a really interesting question as well. Yeah, truly. Um... Yeah, I think they kind of feed into each other for sure. One thing that I didn't uh, point to in my presentation is that the incel community is extremely far reaching and very diverse. Um, you have some that focus on more like the mental health aspect. You have some that focus on just more standard political discourse. Then you have some of the ones that I was pointing to today that were extremely violent and going towards more like the dystopian narratives. Uh, but they do, I think, um, connect very much so with more mainstream, like the right, um, and they feed into each other and fill those ideas. So when you're talking about critical race theory and all these big more buzzwords and like social movements that are coming on Black Lives Matter protests, this Buffalo shooter, they're going to have a response, they're going to feed into it, and then given enough time, there's going to be those pushers and force amplifiers within the space that are going to direct it in a certain way to kind of capitalize on it. I hope that answers the question in full. <laughs> I'm still recovering from um, my attack on the fruit fly. <laughs> You're coughing a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, right, we'll go to John next. So, John, what do you think the role of conspiracy theories like the Great Replacement and the New World Order are in right-wing violent extremist groups? How should these harmful conspiracy theories be countered? That is such a hard question. <laughs> yeah, no, How do you challenge the new world order? <laughs> yeah, it's a super, super light, easy, easy topic here. Um, happy to happy to start this one off. Um, so for, first and foremost, I think it's, it's a great question. I think, you know, looking at the, the role of conspiracies here, um, it's it's hard to miss them any, anywhere you look. I mean, I mean, looking at any of the the kind of right-wing spaces in the aftermath of uh the the incident in buffalo i mean it's it's you know every every other comment is that it's a false flag or that it's a conspiracy or that you know the jews did it or that the guy wasn't well it's you know it's every every other comment at that point basically um i think really you know the, you know you can't really do cve uh you know type policies on on people who think that you know um, the president is a lizard or that, you know, the, the Jews control the media. But like, I think really sunlight is is a good disinfectant here. I think that straightforward, simple, efficient messaging is, is the path forward. And I think that, um, you know, recently we saw DHS rolled out um, that, that kind of disinformation czar role in a, in a very kind of um, admittedly haphazard and, and sort of not really 
super clear way of kind of why, you know, why the Department of Homeland Security is the, the, the ideal space to, to counter disinformation, how they would do so, how they would determine what is disinformation, how they would determine, you know, what, what actions should be taken to kind of counter that. Um, but it, it has to go. It has to go beyond beyond messaging, right? I think like even just basic stuff, like getting getting facts right. Like we we can't be sitting here in in May of 2022 talking about how you know is is this guy a lone wolf? Is 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 he just a, a sad, lonely, mentally ill white kid? Um, we can't talk about is January 6th a false flag? We can't have you know members of Congress talking that you know, Aryan nations did January 6th, you know, it's, it's, it's just getting, getting simple facts, right. And not leaving room for more of these conspiracy theories to seep into, into the public sphere. I think that that's obviously not a, a complete fix, but it, it would, it would help start to kind of stem some of, some of the tide here. There is a second part to that question. Yeah. Sarah, apologies. I missed it at first. <laughs> um, so additionally, what do you think the research gaps are on this normalization of war rhetoric and movement to bring fringe theories and narratives into the mainstream? Yeah, absolutely. I think there, there's there's already been a good amount of, of early research on, on a lot of these topics from some really excellent scholars. But I think really, again, especially in the US, we're always going to have this very weird dichotomy, right? I mean, when you when you bake in you know, the, the traditional role of white supremacy in many of the institutions, when you bake in the fact that, again, like significant subsets of this population think that not only that the election was stolen, but that political violence against the other, against the enemy, against the, the, the perceived outgroup in this instance is not, not only acceptable, but but should should be done, right, is a, is a good thing to do in this case because they are trying to take everything away from you. Um, and so, you know, I think really, especially in the U.S. context, it's it's I think the, the gap is less on the, the research side, because I think there, there's a lot of good research out there. I think it's the application of that research that's really always been lacking here. Right. Like we you know, it's it's you know, again, you, you can talk about Jan 6, you can talk about what happened in Buffalo or any of these other cases. It's we know what our eyes showed us. Right. You, you can you can read the manifesto. You can see for yourself. You can look at the January 6 cases. You can you can see who was there. We we as researchers or practitioners, activists, who, whoever, we, we're you know, largely aware of, of the conditions that exist. And I think it's really about providing that kind of nuanced, data-driven analysis that can be used by policymakers to inform policy. But again, the, the other side of that coin is you have to have policymakers that want to want to make good policy, right? And I mean, I think, again, we're sitting here, you know, a year and three months since Gen 6, um, you know, months after more terrorist attacks, you know, I mean, it's, it's the kind of thing where we, we know that domestic terrorism in the U S has been a problem. We, we are very aware. I think all of us here probably are, are, are keenly aware of the role of this rhetoric that again is, is if it's not on a social media platform, it's protected speech, but you know, there is a direct link that's made. There are, there are direct call outs that are made. There are references that say, you know, I, I did this because this person said that. And I think that you know, it's 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 a, it's time that, that the government starts taking that more seriously and doesn't just focus narrowly on this individual when committed violence, but the kind of entire pathway, the entire ecosystem that supports it and kind of looking at looking at some of the root causes of that as well. Thank you. Um, Erica, next up. Have you noticed any rise in discussions of the accumulation of weapons and talk of accumulating weapons on incel spaces? And do you feel this is influenced by accelerationism? Also, do you see a threat of incels slash black pill driven school shootings coming from the incel communities as the age range has noticeably dropped? Okay, so I took a while for my microphone to load. Uh, thank you so much for the question. I don't know if I can speak to an increase or decrease. Uh, most of the spaces that I monitor are um, more categorical. So I'm looking within specific spaces and monitoring those because the incel universe is very diverse. Um, and I am unfortunately not a weapons expert, but I do now know someone who knows someone. So I will definitely be looking into that. Um, as far as the second question with a rise in black pill school shootings. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. So do you see a threat of incel black pill driven school shootings coming from incel communities as the age range has noticeably dropped? 
Definitely. I think that's been a constant and it is uh, increasing, especially with, um, you know, one of the things that people want when they escalate to violence is media attention. Uh, we see that on within, whether it be um, one of the big cases that we were talking about today or general school shootings like Sandy Hook and the ones that have followed. And so, you know, this idea of sainthood that I pointed to, you want to spread a ripple effect, you want to get noticed and you want to, um, I believe, die for something in some sense of the word. Uh, and so the more that school shootings are on the rise in the United States, the more you can see it talked about within incel discourse as well. Um, it, it's just naturally feeding into each other as I pointed to last time. Thank you, Erica. Uh, now I have a question that's addressed to all the speakers. So can the speakers comment on anti-abortion, anti-LGTQ plus rights, trends in US, Hungary, Italy, Russia, etc. as symptoms of larger problems of gender-based violence promoted by expanding rise in misogynistic racist nationalism? Nice easy question there for the evening. <laughs> I don't know who wants to kick off. Any takers? <laughs> I will. I will. Just, uh, Jonathan, yeah, yes. Points. I will. I will. I will just start and fo focus. Focus on on the U.S. The U.S. context here. Yeah. I mean, look. I think the the reality is it's like 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 I've said. It's it's incredibly hard to disaggregate um, the you know historical racism, historical sexism, traditional gender norms um, that many individuals you know in in the U.S. especially on the right you know, see as, as that ideal, right? See that as the, 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 the tradition that, that, that should be upheld. And so again, like, you know, I think, um, you know, anti-abortion, um, anti-LGBTQ falls, falls into this, into this, you know, massive set of, you know, concerning conspiracies, concerning narratives that, you know, again, like we've, we've seen time and time again, lead, lead to more violence, right? And so, I think you know that's I, I don't I don't have much on um, Hungary, Italy, or, or Russia, but but cer certainly certainly in in the U.S. context, it is it is unsurprising to see such a strong, clear relationship between um, you know misogyny in the manosphere and the the kind of you know traditional racism that that we've long seen as as kind of kind of part of the system here. Thank you, um, Erica. Yeah, I can speak on Russia. Russia. <laughs> yeah, that's mine. Um, despite having an Italian last name, I cannot speak for it. Um, <laughs> as far as um, anti-abortion rhetoric within Russia, it is not the same conversation that we have here. I do. It's such like an easy you're in fifth grade talk about political issues. And this is like one of the top ones that comes up, I feel like within social studies classes. And so I remember asking my class of college students what their opinions are. And it's not as emotionally driven um, at all. Um, as far as anti-LGBTQ and its um, ties to rising racism and xenophobia and misogyny, um, I, I mean, Russia has always been conservative <laughs> when it comes to those types of rights. Um, it is a slow moving um, type of progressivism because I think especially with this war, Russia likes to pose itself as the traditional conservative that is upholding these values. Um, when it, we've heard a lot between Russia and Ukraine and the types, like the differences and similarities between them considering they're both like Slavic countries that have been united throughout history. But um, within Russia, there's a lot of rhetoric around Ukraine being the Slavic brother that has fallen to progressivism and Russia needing to be the big brother to go and save it. Um, and that has a lot to do with the rise of LGBTQ rights within Ukraine. Um, so we can see Russia kind of posturing itself as like the hero. And you can see far-right accelerationist communities like promote Father Putin and like, you know, promoting him and glorifying him for being that figurehead. Thanks, Alexandria, any thoughts? Yes, I was trying to get my mic to work. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. This is not Zoom, I'm used to Zoom. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yes, I, I wanna pay attention to the US context. I'm gonna be pretty brief with this, but I think when I reflect on anti-abortion rights, um, well, first I want to say yes, those are larger, larger symptoms of gender-based violence. So as the rise of you, uh, as the rise of fascist movements increase within the United States, we are going to see far-right groups and individuals um, infiltrate our government. 
Um, so again, to Jonathan's point, I'm also not surprised that we have um, policies and we have uh, policymakers deciding whether, you know, birthing people, like not giving birthing people, birthing people the right to do um, what fits their lifestyle. So we also have to think about how deeply rooted these ideologies are and thinking about ways and strategies, how do we prevent, you know, such harm. And I mean, I mean, yes, they're larger, they're larger sim symptoms, but we also have to think about, um, the role of community organizers and activists. Um, I think that we cannot necessarily rely on our elected officials to make the decisions that are going to support those at the margins, which is why I think research is really important in collaboration with community activists and organizers who have um, historically shifted um, politics. Um, so that's my answer to that question. Thank you. I think the next question is for both Erica and Alexandria. Is there a common misconception to associate incels as young adults or boys? Does your research indicate incels might typically age out? Um, they're mm. thinking about the hot yoga telesy case study. Mm. I think that's an interesting question. I think... I think I'll go first, Eric. That's gonna be brief, and then I'll then I'll give you the floor. <laughs> I think so, from, a, from so I'm I I, can, I consider myself a developmental scientist, um, and within my lab and my work, um, we identify white male youth as a prominent demographic in these spaces. Um, I have not done work about I have not done work that's centered on whether they age out. Um, but, you know, I was just reading Cynthia Miller Aegis's book, um, Hate in the Homeland, and she has a really great chapter. I don't know, the, I forgot the title of it, but she's really talking about the fluidity that I don't think a lot of researchers, including myself, really um, center. Like, what does that mean? It's like, how, do, how, how are white male youth um, going in and out of spaces? So that's something that I definitely want to look into more. Um, but to answer the question, um, from a developmental scientist perspective, um, you know, youth development is my focus um, and white male youth are a prominent demographic. Okay. Um, yeah, I would agree the young white male is a large demographic of it. However, I do feel like the narrative is appealing to many ages and many races. Um, I think mainly one of the reasons that contributes to it being so young is because it's an online forum like community. Um, you can do it on like discords, there's um, incel.is and YouTube and main social media platforms where younger people are generally spending most of their time, especially if you're experiencing some depression over being involuntarily celibate and failing with women as far as romantically um, seeking out those spaces. However, there are, there are um, an older, identity within it. They just, I think, interact a little bit differently um, and find their information maybe more on Facebook than some of the other social media platforms. I want to add to that. I would, I agree with you, Erica, and thinking about um, like one of the GNET pieces that I was writing about were identified specifically within Black males um, podcasts being, you know, there's so many different podcasts. They're talking about Ooh, they're talking about um, the gym, all of these, all of these things. But within those messaging, um, it's about devaluing black women. So we, so I think for me as a developmental psychologist, it's like, how do we, how can we affirm specifically black men? How can we, how can we create spaces where black male youth feel affirmed? Um, without devaluing black women. So I think you you make an excellent point in terms of um, that it just manifests in different ways. Like there are going to be people that are older and older that are that have these ideologies. They just may not be engaging in this space, but they could be engaging in other ways. Thank you. Now back to John, a really interesting question for you. What impact might the January 6th committee have on far-right extremism in the US if it recommends indicting some of the suspects? 
In your opinion, if the DOJ does choose to indict some of these individuals, will that change the TTPs employed by far-right extremists? Yeah, again, another super easy light question. To kind Just of a light question really for midnight. Yeah. That's good stuff, yeah, <laughs> love it. Um, no, look, um, the, the, the short answer is I, I don't see the work or findings of the select committee vastly changing what you know the what, what we understand the kind of focus of most of these segments we talk about with Jan 6 or the far right to be today um, I think when you, when you look at kind of the parallel DOJ J6 um, what you see is that the Jan, Jan 6 has taken the lead in terms of kind of the the, the, the public depositions the hearings um, and have kind of been working um, from that top down, right? Really, really trying to trying to get to the get to the core of again what what a lot of us know, um, which is kind of the the role and relationship between violent extremists, the kind of um, mass of of MAGA QAnon individuals, and um, you know individuals who either uh, inspired, incited, bust people down, um, led people to the Capitol, or or you know otherwise contributed to, to the acts of January 6th in some way, um, both inside, outside the administration. Um, and while, on the other hand, DOJ is taking this very slow, methodical approach, charging 800 individuals nearly to date, um, mostly starting with kind of your, your kind of capital tourist, right? Your kind of grandma from Iowa who walked inside, took a photo and left, to then work their way up to the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, and these kind of significant conspiracy networks that we know and love. Um, but really, I, I think that the important consideration here is less about J6's kind of suggestions to indict, because in, in, in my assessment, I think DOJ is already moving down that pathway that, that they're moving down kind of regardless of what J6 committee does. I think J6 committee has a, a lot of evidence, obviously, from these depositions, from, from the kind of investigations they've been doing that can inform DOJ actions, but, but I think DOJ can reach that on their own. Now, in terms of the, the response, I think it's, it's important to, to make clear, I've, I've been saying this for a year and three months now, but it's it's far less about the kind of corpus of folks who are charged or indicted um, in, in these cases, and, and far more about this continued narrative that January 6th was a false flag or a, a monumental victory that has to be repeated. Um, and I think in, in, in the time since January 6th, all you've seen is that those voices have gotten louder, that the individuals who are promoting these conspiracy theories are, again, running for elected office in, in places like Pennsylvania, um, are, are you know, still in positions of power, are, are positioning themselves to be individuals who have a direct role to play in the 2024 election. And simultaneously, you're seeing domestic violent extremist movements like the Proud Boys really move back down to that local level, right? Mobilizing at school boards, mobilizing to, to local election offices. And, and I think when you when you talk about mobilization, both uh, in uh, you know of violent extremism and, and political violence in 2022, in 2024, I think it, it really will be at that local level, at, at again election offices, at, at state capitals, and it, it won't necessarily be because you know person X Y Z was indicted or charged, but because the the, the right wing ecosystem in this country has you know set the tone so aggressively, so loud, and so early that you know they are trying to take the election from you, and they will try and do it again. And the only solution to that is to go engage in an act of violence to protect what's yours. And so I think that's that for me is is will always have more of an impact on the kind of TTPs than than DOJ actions. And, and thank you for the question. So if there are no further questions, then I'm sure you will join me in thanking our wonderful panelists for sparing their time and presenting such wonderful presentations and answering some very difficult questions. <laughs> so thank you so much. It's been a delight to chair this panel. I've definitely learned a lot. Um, and yeah, if there's uh, no other questions, um, please feel free to enjoy your evenings. And thank you once again, panelists.